Last week, we briefly introduced Melchizedek, the king of Salem. We're going to talk about him a little bit more this week. <clears throat> Before we do, let's open with a word of <clears throat> prayer. Heavenly Father, we rejoice at your goodness. We rejoice that you have sent your son, Jesus, to die for our sins, that uh, we would not perish but have eternal life in him. We thank you and we bless your name for the salvation that you give to all who believe in him, uh, from your servant Abraham, even to us. So open to us now the scriptures by your spirit, that we may be made wise unto salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's start, let's, let's, let's start at Genesis 14. We'll get kind of a rolling start. I, a lot of folks had to leave there toward the end, so we'll, we'll, we'll back up a little bit. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king, king of Elisar, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyaim, these kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these joined forces in the, in the valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Chedorlaomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim at Ashtaroth Karanim, or Karnaim, sorry, the Zuzim and Ham, the Emim and Shaveh Kiriathim, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazazon Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboiim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out, and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim with Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyaim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits, and, the king, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions, and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions, and went their way. <clears throat> then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and of Honor. <clears throat> These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them back to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. This is establishing uh, what's coming next, which is not only important, it's critically so. But first we begin with, with Abram. Abram is the son of the pagan Terah. He dwells in the land of Ur. <laughs> Ur is here. <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah are over here. Sodom and Gomorrah are much closer to the land of Canaan. They're, they're part of the land of Canaan. Ur is, is out toward where the Tower of Babel was, the plains of Shinar, Mesopotamia, um, very far east. So, you have this, this regional war. You have four kings against five. In the midst of all of this, however, Lot, who's Lot? Abram's nephew, he gets taken captive. Because of this, Abram leads his own private army. Father Abraham was a real man. He leads his own private army. How many? 318. And he goes and he, what does he do? He pursues them at night. He defeats them. Then he brings back all of, the, all of the loot that was taken. That is, all the slaves that were taken captive, all of the possessions and the wealth that was taken. He brings them back to Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> now, of course, when you think of Sodom and Gomorrah, you think of slightly later on in the narrative when Sodom and Gomorrah are basically stand-ins for roughly as wicked as man gets after the fall. 
I'm not saying they're not wicked now, but um, they were they were dispossessed of their things by these regional kings. Most importantly, for Abram's sake, one of them was Lot. So Abram goes to get back Lot, and he returns the possessions of of these kings. Right? It's it's going to be of note in the next section when Abram returns what what was taken. He does not keep any for himself. I mean, that would have been the obvious thing, right? Call it a finder's fee, you know, hold back a couple of nice things and give, give everything else. But this is all I could find, guys. That, this is not Abram. Abram is a righteous man. Verse 17. After his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So two kings go out to meet Abram. The king of Sodom goes out to meet him at the Valley of Shava, and Melchizedek, the king of Salem. <clears throat> Most likely, Salem is going to be what we would later call Jerusalem. It's not called Jerusalem yet. Um, not for a long time, actually. But, more than likely, that's, that's where we're talking about. Why do they come out to meet Abram? Yeah, they're praising the victor, right? I am, as an Ohioan, I am not a fan of the University of Michigan, but they're singing Hail to the Victors, right? It's, it is such a thing that, that for an entire week, the whole state of Ohio will not use one letter of the alphabet. I promise that is not a joke. <laughs> so, all right. I have that completionist thing, you know. Um, they're, yeah, they're praising him, right? Because... Abram won back all that was lost, and he gave them to him, right? So <clears throat> the king of Sodom comes out to do that. The king of Salem does that as well, but the king of Salem, we're told a little bit more about him, because what are we told about, <clears throat> about the king of Sodom? I mean, yeah, not much. I mean, he's the king of Sodom, so fill in the blank, right? Um, Melchizedek, on the other hand, we're told he's king of Salem. We're also told he was, he was a priest. But not just a priest, because pagans have priests too, right? This is the priest of God Most High. Now, does this mean he's a priest of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yes. Yes. Now, they don't have that formulation yet, but he's calling on the same God we do, right? This is the point. And the king of Salem, Melchizedek, blesses Abram. Now, if Melchizedek is blessing Abram, does that mean that Melchizedek is greater than Abram? Yes. The greater blesses the lesser. And he says, blessed be Abram, and then he says, blessed be God Most High. So, blessed be Abram by God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth. So, Melchizedek is making a claim about the God that he serves. This is not a regional God, right? This is not the God of like one valley or one lake or one grove of oaks. This is the God who, who not only dwells in, but owns what? Heaven and earth. 
Now, to our Christian ears, that doesn't really sound that unusual because we talk about this, we, we, we talk about our God this way all the time, right? Blessed are you, O oh Lord, our God, King of all creation. We talk this way all the time. But to a pagan's ear, Abram's not a pagan, but, but to the ear of a, of a pagan, this is going to sound like a very grandiose claim of one's God. In fact, it is a grand claim of one's God, isn't it? My, my God is not only the most powerful regional God. My God is the one who lives, the one who is, the one who always has been, and the one who owns both heaven and earth. So Melchizedek blesses Abram, and then he blesses God, and he notes that God was the one who delivered Abram's enemies. The victory ultimately came, I mean, Abram did do battle. His, his servants did do battle. But God gave them the victory. The victory came by, by that God. And what does Abram know of this God yet? Not much. But there has been a covenant made, right? In the previous chapter, there's at least the first, the first giving of the covenant. But even then, there's not much detail filled in. So Abram's learning about who this God is. And, I mean, 318 soldiers is a lot. But when you compare that to the kings he was going up against, that victory was almost certainly a miracle. And so Abram gives Melchizedek, that's the hymn, he gives Melchizedek a tenth of everything. Now, Luther in his commentary on this is very, very keen to say, this does not mean a tenth of the loot, because the loot was owned by the people it was stolen from. Abram is tithing to Melchizedek. Right. The king of Sodom says to Abram, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let honor Eshcol and Mamre take their share. So the king of Sodom, seeing what Melchizedek does, wants to give, wants to let Abram keep ten, you know, a tenth of what, what he had taken. And Abram says, no. I don't want you to think that I somehow enriched myself by this. That wasn't the point. The point was Lot. So you keep it. I'll, I'll just take whatever the men ate, because how are you going to give that back? How is Abram righteous? We're gonna, the, Moses will tell us verbatim in the next chapter. Because <laughs> you're exactly right. That's, that's the question I'm trying to lay some, some foundation for, is how is it then that Abram is righteous? Now, what else do we know about Melchizedek? Not a whole lot. Um, this is basically all the, all the Bible has to say about Melchizedek, right? Turn to Hebrews chapter 7. If, if nothing else, I'm hoping that as we go through the Old Testament together, one of the things we learn is that one of the greatest tools we have for understanding the Old Testament is the New Testament. Now, what's odd is that Moses doesn't write a whole lot of detail about Melchizedek, but the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews, we'll just call him Paul, um, says rather a lot and, and, and gives to him great importance. So Hebrews chapter 7, uh, for this, actually let's back up a little bit. We have this as a, as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the, the Most High God, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. So, again, it, 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 it's worth noting that here something is going on that we also saw, saw in 
Galatians chapter 3, which is in the New Testament, the author who is inspired by the Holy Spirit is, is taking the text of the Old Testament and parsing it according to the grammar and finding the meaning behind the words and the structure, right? So we talked about in Genesis chapter 12 that Paul in Galatians 3 notes the seed is singular, right? Because it refers to Christ. Here, the author of the epistle to the Hebrews, uh, it's an unsigned letter, so we're not entirely certain, but the author writes that he is king of righteousness and king of peace. Now, where does, where does he get this? Well, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Um, the Hebrew word malach means king. He's king of righteousness. He's also king of peace because he's the king of Salem, right? Salem is related to the Hebrew word for peace. Um, words like shalom. Someone last week mentioned that, that Melchizedek is noted as not having a father or a mother. Well, is that important? Well, it, here in Hebrews, the author makes that very point. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. He's still talking about Melchizedek, right? Because it sounds like he's talking about someone else. Um, he doesn't have a genealogy in the way that we do. I mean, Melchizedek has a father and a mother. I mean, for example, if the Jews were right and Melchizedek is Shem, and again, if you do the math, Shem outlived Abraham. Shem certainly was alive during this, this period of time. And Shem, being the heir of the promise, is likely going to have knowledge of the true God because his descendants are going to become the priests and, and those who, um, who teach the, the law. But on the other hand, his father and mother are not noted in Genesis. And the, the author of the Hebrews, or the, the epistle to the Hebrews, makes the point he's without father or mother genealogy. He doesn't have a beginning of days or end of life. We're not told that Melchizedek was born or died. We don't know, yeah, we don't know much about him at all. He just kind of pops in there. But if, if you look at the end of chapter 6, we're told that Jesus is a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Remember what the epistle to the uh, Hebrews is about. It's written to Hebrew Jewish Christians who need to understand what has passed away and what has come and what the importance was and is of the old things, like the temple because after all, that's going to be destroyed. Like the priesthood, that's going to go away too. Like Moses, he's not going to go away. Um, so the priesthood was temporary. The priesthood would come to an end, and that is the Levitical priesthood, right? What do I mean by Levitical priesthood? Yeah, the sons of Levi, right? From the, the, because the priests had to come from Levi. Well, how is Jesus not a Levitical priest? <laughs> yeah, for one thing, he's not from Levi. He's from Judah. So already he can't be a Levitical priest. He's a, he's, in other words, it's not Jesus is the best Levitical priest who ever lived. His priesthood is of a different order, one like Melchizedek. And the most noteworthy thing about Melchizedek's priesthood is that his priesthood continues, right? It endures. Now, Melchizedek as a man will die, but Jesus, his priesthood is forever. And that's the point in Hebrews, is that Jesus' priesthood does not come to an end. It surpasses the priesthood of the Levites, and it is greater. Order? So order here is going to be like by God's order, by his decree, that he institutes it. Now, why, why did I make that seemingly odd point about Melchizedek being greater than Abram? I completely stole it from the Bible. 
Um, <laughs> I hope that's not cheating. But look at verse 4. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. There's a lot there, right? First of all, we note that Abraham the patriarch, and is Abraham the patriarch a great man? We don't call him patriarch for nothing, right? Um, Abraham is, an, is an indeed, indeed a great man. Doesn't mean he's sinless, but he's a great man. He's, the, he's a patriarch. What's a patriarch? So, yeah, so this, this comes from, from like ruling. So like you have, a, you have a nemesis, but then there's like an arch nemesis. In the church, there are heretics. Well, they're not in the church, but there's also the title arch heretic, which is given to whom? Arius. Arius is not merely a heretic. He is an arch heretic. That is, he's, he's like a king heretic. It's like, like being a garbage king, but you know, whatever. Um, so, here, he's a father. Now, calling Abram at this point a father is a bit odd, considering what? Doesn't have any children. Although, in Hebrews it says, Levi is in his loins. Now, who is Levi to Abraham? Great-grandson, right? Because... Abraham begets Isaac, Isaac begets Jacob, Jacob begets Levi, right? Right, so we're, we're a ways away from, from Levi yet. Nonetheless, in the Hebrews, we consider Levi even tithed to, to Melchizedek through Abraham. This, this is a tremendous, I'm not, I would never be bold enough to say anything that I don't know, that, that emphatic, unless it were given to me in the Bible. Right? The patriarch is the, the father of fathers, like the, 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 the father of, one might say, many nations. Right? He's not the only person afforded the, the title patriarch in the Old Testament. Who else do we call patriarchs? Adam? Yeah. Noah? Jacob, right. Now, coming to the, to the point in Hebrews 7, uh, verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? What's, what's that question asking? It's rhetorical. If salvation were possible under the law, then the lawgivers would have been capable of bestowing eternal perfection by their, by their ministry. However, that, that did not happen. Rather, what happened is, the way salvation is made available to mankind is from a priest that is of a different order. Not the order of Aaron. Wait, Aaron? Who's Aaron? Right. All the priests had to come from the house of Aaron, right? Aaron was a Levite. Right. So, if, if it were possible for salvation to be under the law, then the greatest of the priests would be after the order of Aaron but he's not. He's after the order of Melchizedek. This is to show that salvation does not come by works of the law.
Verse 12, for when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. Who's that referring to? In verse 13. Jesus, Jesus right? Jesus is a priest serving at the altar, but he's not after the same tribe. He's not a Levite, right? Now, what altar did Jesus serve at? The cross. Excellent. Right? The cross is the altar at which he makes the sacrifice. Isn't that what an altar is, where you make sacrifices? Where did Jesus make the sacrifice that bestowed truly and forever salvation to mankind? On the cross, right? So he's, he's a different kind of priest serving at a different kind of altar where rather than having sacrifices that do not, um, they do not forgive sins, he instead gives himself for the forgiveness of the sins of the entire world. Right? That's what we sing in that communion hymn, right? Gives his body for the feast. What's the next phrase? Christ the victim, Christ the priest, alleluia. Right? That's, that's a tremendously worded phrase because it says so much in such a small, in such a small uh, span. Verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. How do we know, how is it evident that Jesus is descended from Judah? He's the son of David, right? And those, those two gospels that begin with genealogies are there to demonstrate who this Jesus is, where he comes from, right? And in Matthew's gospel, is made abundantly clear he's descended from Judah through David. Verse 15, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Right, So this is a priesthood of a different kind. And how is it that Jesus has earned the right to be this priest? Yeah, by an indestructible life, not by bodily descent. And his priesthood endures how long? Forever, right? Without beginning, without end. What does Jesus say of himself? I am the Alpha and the Omega. For on the one hand, a former command, commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So in other words, it's, it's not Jesus gives you the power to fulfill the law, and then become righteous. Rather, he gives you a better hope, right? When Jesus preaches, he says, unless your righteousness, what? Exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, what does he mean by that? Does he mean just try harder than the Pharisees? Good luck! Their entire life was shaped around trying harder. You're, you're not going to do that. Pharisees would have been awesome neighbors. They would have been very conscientious. Like Mormons. But, inwardly, of course, they're whitewashed tombs. Like Mormons. So, trying harder was not the answer. You need a different kind of righteousness. And in Romans, we, we hear what that righteousness is, right? And now, now another righteousness has been revealed, what? Apart from the law. Well, that, so that righteousness is going to be very much in mind. Verse 20, And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who has said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Uh, where does that come from? 
Psalm 110. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So, one of the benefits of having Jesus as your high priest is that he lives forever, which means, remember how we had this happen in the Judges, where once the judge rescued Israel from their, from their oppression, they, they enjoyed a life of peace for how long? Until the judge died. And then it was, we're back on the wheel, here we go again. Right? Jesus, on the other hand, is eternal. He doesn't die. As a matter of fact, he did die, and then he was resurrected. He'll never die again. Death has no dominion over him. So, you're able to draw near to him, not only because he has a better hope, but because he is not prevented by death from remaining your priest. And it also says that he makes intercession for us. What does that mean? Yeah, he, yeah, he brings forth on behalf of, brings forth to whom? The Father, right? So when Jesus tells us to pray, what, what does he tell us to say? Our Father. How are we, the creation, how are we able to say our Father? Because Jesus, the intercessor, tells us, pray to the Father. Say our Father. It's almost like there's a new kind of righteousness, a different righteousness that's been revealed apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Right. Oddly enough, Abraham did. So back to, to Genesis 14. Right. Now, now Jesus, Jesus is, in fact, a kinsman redeemer. He saves his kinsmen. Who are his kin? Well, he's born of the tribe of Judah. He's, he's a Hebrew. Salvation is of the Jews, right? However, he's also the son of man, which is to say he's become the kinsman of all of, of the race of man, all the descendants of Adam. Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. All right. You have no idea how frustrating it is for a Lutheran pastor to read Genesis 15 and stop short of verse 6, but we will get there. Um, <laughs> but we have to set the stage for verse 6. So, okay, so af after Abram rescues Lot, he's blessed by Melchizedek. He tithes to Melchizedek. The word of the Lord comes to Abram. Again, he says, what, fear not? I'm your shield. Your reward will be very great. Now look at verse 2. Abram seems to think that the reward is going to involve a son. Well, the Lord did tell him back in chapter 12 that your seed will inherit this land. And so Abram believes that the Lord will give the blessing that he said he would. So Abram doesn't go, well, I'm poor. Of course, he's not. But he says, I'm childless. Now, does that mean that children are wealth? Yes, but that's incidental to the point. Um, <laughs> but I never miss an opportunity to make that point. Children are wealth, right? Sinking money into your children is like polishing your Lamborghinis. You know, you're, you're protecting a tremendous amount of wealth that you have. So... What will you give me? I continue childless. And note, you haven't given me an offspring. This is what he says in verse 3. You have given me no offspring. So Abram recognizes that, one, God promised offspring and offspring, a, a descendant. Two, they would come from God. 
right? You have given me no offspring. So Abram believes that the Lord will do this, but how's this going to happen? I, I don't have any offspring. You haven't given me one yet. And at this point, a member of my household will be my heir. Now, understand that household, and this is a good key to reading the book of Acts and defending Christian baptism, household does not mean just the father, the mother, and, and their 2.1 children. Household is going to involve the slaves. Oh, and by the way, the children of the slaves. Um, even in Rome, there were quarters for the slaves, the, the children of the slaves, right? Um, household is going to be a very expansive term. And in my household, the heir at this point is whom? Eliezer of Damascus, meaning not his own child. And God tells him, no, this man's not going to be your heir. Your very own son will be your heir. Now understand that the word son has two meanings. It can either mean the, the male issued directly from the father, or it can be a descendant, a male descendant of. So Jesus is the son of David. Well, David's son is named Solomon. Okay, but he's the son of Solomon. You, you, see, you see how this works? Um, but he's not going to be your heir. And then... God takes him outside and says, look, look toward heaven, number the stars, if you're able to number them. Um, even, even now we can't do that. This is tremendous. Even with all our technology and James Webb telescopes and all that other stuff, we still don't know how many stars there are. We, we guess at best. And if you, if you think there are a lot of stars, get out from the light pollution. Go out to rural Wyoming and look up at, in, a, in a really clear winter night. And you realize there are roughly about 100 million times more stars than you thought there were when you can really see the night sky well, and I assume there's probably not a lot of like light pollution going on at this point in history, you know, 2000 some odd BC. Um, and so, number the stars if you're able to. In other words, I know you're not. And that's how many your offspring shall be. So in, in chapter 12, your singular offspring will, will inherit. However, you will also have offspring so numerous you can't count count them. Now, in Revelation, remember when, when John saw all the tribes of Israel lined up nice and neat? 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher. 12. And then he turns and looks, and what does he see? A great multitude that no one could number from every tribe, language, nation on earth. All of them, the 12,000s, of, of the tribes of Israel, and the great multitude that no one could number, all of those are sons of Abraham. And again, we mentioned this last week, but our Lutheran churches are full of Japhethite kids singing about Father Abraham, and it's right for them to do so. He is our father by faith. Now, to verse 6. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So we've already seen righteous deeds that Abram has done. We've seen his selflessness, his courage. But none of those are described as, reckoning, as, as God reckoning them as righteousness. Here, however, we're told that Abram believes the Lord. And that, that belief, was counted to him as righteousness. It's it's really not possible to, over, to overstate the importance of this verse, not only to the Old Testament, but to the entire Bible. Because, it, exactly, if we are to be a son of Abraham, what does that mean? Bodily descent? We talked about that last week in John chapter 8. Big deal. If, if, if it were about bodily descent, God could make from stones children for Abraham. Rather, to be a child of Abraham, to be a son of Abraham, is... is is to believe what Abraham believed. So it's not that when it comes to salvation in the Old Testament, it's not like, well, in the Old Testament, salvation was by works, but now in the New Testament, salvation is, is, is by grace, by the gospel. In the Old Testament, the saints were saved by faith in the promise. In the New Testament, saints are saved because of their faith in the promise. You're saved in the same manner that Abram was. I believe now you have more knowledge than Abram did at that time, right? What for, for what for him was in the future is for us. A lot of it is in the past. 
So did Abram believe in Jesus? Yes. We, however, have his name and, and the events of his earthly ministry. This verse gets cited in the book of Concord. I, is, is there another verse that gets cited more than this one? I don't know. Um, but, but this gets appealed to a lot because in the 16th century, when, when the Lutherans are disputing with Rome over the doctrine of justification, we point out that not only is salvation by grace through faith alone not novel to the New Testament, it wasn't even novel to the Old Testament. So Luther didn't invent this. Augustine didn't invent this. Even Paul didn't invent this. Even Jesus didn't invent this. This was around in the days of Abram. This is the manner by which Abram is saved, faith in Jesus. So rather than introducing new theology, because we just didn't want to like try to do the works of the law, the, the point the Lutherans were always making is this is nothing novel. It's not novel to the medieval church. It's not novel to the New Testament church. It's not novel to the church at any time. This is the means by which Abram was saved. All right, this is a decent stopping point. Um, so next week we'll continue uh, Genesis 15, 7. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you. <laughs>